Praise the Lord. Welcome to our weekend service. Um, today, before we have a time of worship, we want to prepare our hearts to say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. This week, um, as I was uh, just going through my lessons and my classes in St. Paul Bible College, um, one of the lecturers reminded us how in the early church, when the, there was so much um, heresies that is within the church and there was persecution from without the church, that the apostles had to come together and the early church had to come together to have a creed. So that based on the creed, that uh, believers know what actually do they really believe in. And so this afternoon, as we were saying the creed together, even a simple phrase like, Jesus is Lord, is actually a creed that we, it was one of the earliest creed, uh, no, so that it actually professes what we believe as believers and, and Christians. So today, let's um, look to the Lord, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, and let's commit today's service to Him. Amen. Dear Jesus, we thank You for Your presence, that right now, here in this place, as we, uh, Lord, uh, worship You as uh, our members everywhere, all over, uh, Singapore are watching this service, that your presence, Lord, will touch us. And once again, your Holy Spirit will minister and touch our hearts and will work in our lives. And we also pray that through the preaching of the Word today, that we will all be comforted and we will all learn to love you with all our heart and to learn, oh God, to, what is your plans and your purposes for our lives. We commit today's service to you and we pray that in the name of Jesus Christ be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
presence to come and guide us as we look and study into your word. We pray, O oh God, that you give us peace in our heart. Enlighten us, O oh God, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We commit our time of listening to your word to you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you are hearing me well, and um, I just have one announcement. Yeah, this is the announcement to tell you that you can join our announcement group chat. And you can contact Sharon Tan at 9637 I want to make is that next week, we will be having a communion, okay? Because even though we are actually having our services on Saturday, but Sunday of that week is actually the first day of the new month. Okay, so I just thought I'd let you all know next week we will be having communion. Okay, praise the Lord. I want you to take out your Bibles as we look into the Word of God today. Exodus, we're going to continue our study. And today, the title of my message is um, A Journey to Sinai. Okay, so we will be looking at Exodus chapter 14 to 18. And, uh, but I will begin from Exodus chapter 12 today. today. But before we go on, I just want to do a bit of a recap what we have learned uh, last the two weeks ago when we came together. Uh, you remember how we looked at the ten plagues, and we saw and the, how the plagues were actually signs and wonders that God did to demonstrate that God or Yahweh alone is God, and there is none other. I think that is very important. There's no other God. Okay? And he has defeated all the gods of Egypt uh, because I told you that the ten plagues were actually, each of the plagues were really uh, in direct confrontation with the gods that the Egyptians were worshipping, including Pharaoh himself, who was also a god, uh, in the eyes of the Egyptian. And also Pharaoh's son was also considered divine, his son as well. So, the death of the firstborn was also a direct confrontation to the Egyptian belief that Pharaoh or his son were divine. Okay? So then we also saw how God allowed Pharaoh to change his heart before God actually came in to harden his heart. Right? So we saw that last uh, two, time, uh, two weeks ago, the last time we came together. As God reveals himself, and I share with you that as God reveals himself to Israel, um, in other words, whatever God does to Israel, at the same time, it's, it's like a self-revelation of God to Israel. But at the same time, Israel are to bear witness of what God has done. In other words, Israel's role is to be a, a body or a, a nation of witnesses. It's not just what they must do. It's not a doing. It's a more like they are witnesses. Everything that is done in their life becomes a testimony of who Yahweh is. I'll give you an example. In the New Testament, Jesus told the disciples that you shall be witnesses to me. And why does he say that? Because the disciples physically witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they are everywhere they go as they continue to preach the gospel, they are witnessing the resurrection of Jesus Christ because they have seen it with their own eyes. So, if last week, what we have learned was, or I shouldn't say last week, but if the last time we came together, what we have learned is leaving Egypt, in the leaving of Egypt, God showed himself to be, I am the Lord. Then this week, what I want to show you is that in the journey to Sinai, God continues to do works in their in their in their life, that they can be witnesses. Okay, so that is the main thrust of my message today. It is in this light that I will be sharing today's sermon, that you are witnesses. So if you look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 29, okay, so I'm just still at the introduction, introduction portion, portion of my sermon, okay? I just want to highlight some of the things that we didn't manage to see the previous time. Now, in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 29, if you have a Bible, you can just turn uh, with me. And it says, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne 
to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now, if you compare this great cry to, the, to Exodus chapter 2, earlier, uh, a few weeks back, when we look at how Pharaoh uh, commanded that all the male children or the male child of every Hebrew family is to be thrown into the river now. And the Bible says that there was a great cry. And the, the, the Hebrews or the Israelites cry out to God. So now you see that the author of, of Exodus is trying to show that now the tables are turned against the Egyptians and now they are the ones who have a great cry. Okay, and then I want you to see verse 35. We are just looking at the Passover and then how they came out after the 10th plague, how they came out. Now, on verse, let's continue, okay? Uh, verse, why don't we look at verse 31? Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. So the Egyptians urged the people and they, that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So, verse 35. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now, I want to share this portion for two reasons. One, the gold and the articles of silver, the clothing. Eventually, when they went to the wilderness, when the call or the, or the instruction was given to Moses for the children of Israel to build the tabernacle, now this is where they were able to give the offerings of the gold and the silver and the, and the materials for the making of the tabernacle. So I just thought, it's important for you to, to see where that has come from. And also, I want you to know that God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, when Abraham had a vision uh, that for his descendants will be in a foreign nation for 400 years, and how God will judge the nation, and then God will bring them up, and God, uh, the children of Israel will plunder that nation. So now here in Exodus chapter uh, 12, we see the fulfillment of that prophecy or that promise to Abraham. Okay, so that passage in Genesis is Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 to 14. Now, one more interesting thing uh, for us to observe is this. And let's look at verse 37. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sarkov, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Verse 38, okay, is where I want you to pay attention. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. This phrase, a mixed multitude, is to show us that not only did the Israelites leave Egypt, but non-Israelites also left together with them. Now, why is this important? Remember God's promise to Abraham that through you, the families of the earth will be blessed. So even when they are now in Egypt, through the ten plagues, God allowed the non-Israelites to see His power and His glory, and they were willing to move out that night together with the Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness. This mixed multitude was later mentioned again in the book of Numbers. So we see that, I, this is my personal, uh, as I read the, the scripture, that when you talk about 600,000 men on foot, okay, that it is not just the Israelites. The 600,000 is not just Israelites, but it, is, it includes the other non-Israelites as well. Because if I were to look at the history of them being there for 400 years, if you remember, they came into Egypt with 70 of them, just 70. In 400 years, it is not really possible to have 600,000 men. Okay? Because no one lives 400 years. So when you count the multiplication of every generation, 
you can only take the last probably 100 years to count how many of them are Israelites. And it's not that. It's not really possible to have 600,000. I've done a certain uh, calculation uh, before. And maybe if you're interested, you can just do that yourself you know, one day. You know, just use Excel and try to do some calculation. And you must take into account the, um, the 70 people that went. Uh, they were, uh, it includes children and it includes the whole family. Okay, so just pay attention to, the, to that. Now let's continue. And so there is just some interesting observation for you. But I want to highlight what is more important, and that is the night that they left Egypt, uh, it was imprinted in their memory with solemn observations of three things. Okay, I want you to see the verses in verse 42. It is a night of solemn observation to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observations, observation for all the children of Israel throughout their generation. There are three things that God commanded them to continue doing to remember this night. Okay, and the three things are, number one, the Passover is to be celebrated annually. It is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which also will be celebrated annually. And the last one is a consecration of the firstborn male. Okay, so let me just take some time to, to speak about this. Now, these observations right, serve as a witness for generations to come what God did for the Israelites. So let's look at some scripture, okay? In, in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 25, it says, It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as He promised, then you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? Then you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our household. So it is meant for to be celebrated every year for the purposes so that there is an opportunity for your children and your children's children for perpetuity to ask the question, why are we celebrating the Passover? And so that the parent can recount this night that God delivered them out of Egypt by a mighty hand. Do you understand? Such important, uh, uh, this thing called observation, uh, observance, okay? This ordinance that continues on and on. Now, the second feast is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this is uh, also to be celebrated together with the Passover. But... Um, Bible scholars tell us this, that during the time where the temple uh, destroyed and they could not offer of, or, or find a place to actually dis or kill the Passover lamb, so the Feast of Unleavened Bread was called, sort of like continue, was continued to be celebrated so that the people could continue to remember this night. So I think God is like really quite amazing, you know, because He, he used two feasts and put it together instead of just allowing the Feast of Passover. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, for example, in AD 70, when the temple was destroyed by the Romans, thereafter, there was no more sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So how do the Jews continue to remember that God has brought them out of Egypt? By celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay? So these are very important. And then the last one, the consecration of the firstborn male. Now, the picture is this. Every male firstborn of every family belongs to God. Why? Because the night that the angel of death passed over, all the other Egyptian firstborn died. Only the Israelites Egyptian, uh, firstborn who, who were in a house and then the blood was on the doorpost, right? Those firstborn lived. And so God is saying, then this son belongs to me. So how are they going to keep this ordinance and continue to remember this night? Is that every male from every animal, uh, there is a clean animal, needs to be killed. Male firstborn needs to be killed and sacrificed to the Lord. And, but, but if you are Israelite, so when you, when you are a little baby as you are growing up and you see your father does this, right? 
then you will ask the question, why that do you need to sacrifice all these male uh, animals, the firstborn? And then the father can say, well, these sacrifices represents, it's almost like it represents how the Egyptian firstborn uh, died. And then you, okay, little boy, who is the firstborn male son, you live. And so again, that is a way to remember this night. So this um, event is such an important event that throughout the Old Testament, it is repeated again and again whenever Israel goes through a very difficult time or difficult period in their history, they always remember how God delivered them out of Egypt. And what, how does this apply for us? Well, this story it doesn't just apply to the Israelites. It applies to us because it reveals who God is, you see. It reveals that God is a God who protects and cares for His people and sanctifies them, consecrates them to Himself and watches over them and protects them. It also speaks about how the Passover lamb, the blood that was shed, was for the protection of God's people. So therefore today, who is our Passover, our Paschal lamb, is Jesus Christ. And He shed His blood for us so that we, are, we too belong to the people of God. Amen. So I think this is important for you to, to see, okay, that everything that happens is so that Israel can continue to witness, to be a witness. Observance, this thing, okay, is a very important aspect. And even for us as a family, you know, we always, how, how do we do observance? Simple things like birthdays. We do, we celebrate our children's birthday. And we, by celebrating the birthday, we're actually celebrating the birth of this person, right? Now, for us as a nation as well, National Day is, is around the corner. And you know that there are National Day observance where the story of our independence is retold again. Uh, there is a singing of the national anthem. There's a raising of the Singapore flag. And so these are observance to remember our history. Similarly, we also have Racial Harmony Day observance. And it's to remember that we are a multi-racial and multicultural society. So, so even to today, in modern times, we still do observance to remember certain things about our history. Okay? Like now in the church, in our context of a modern church, we have observance like, for example, during the Easter weekend, right? We always celebrate Good Friday to remember the death of Jesus Christ and Resurrection Sunday. We also have communion. So that's why I say next week we're having communion. Communion is to remember the new covenant uh, that we have now uh, been established through the blood of Jesus Christ. We also have time where we, um, during December period, we celebrate Christmas. We remember the birth of Jesus Christ. And during Pentecost Sunday, we remember the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. So you see, these are things that happens in a church calendar as well, okay, to continue to remind us of what God has done in our lives. So now, let's go on to Exodus chapter 13, and we want to see the journey to Sinai, right? So in this journey to Sinai, you see that God was with the children of Israel in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the verse is actually taken from Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 to 22. He says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, this pillar of cloud, eventually when they built the tabernacle, okay, then the pillar of cloud resided in the tabernacle. So I want you to have this imagery in your mind, okay? That God, if He was in the cloud, He doesn't have a resting place. So He, he continues to go before the children of Israel to prepare the way or lead the direction, but He Himself doesn't rest because there is no tabernacle yet. Okay, so Psalms 121 
verse 1 to 8 has a very beautiful psalm. And the psalm actually says that this God, the Lord, neither sleeps nor slumbers. Okay, so let me read to you this psalm. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence come my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. And that is a picture of the cloud by day so that they will not be scorched by the hot sun. Okay, because he's like a cloud that shields them or or provides shade for them. And the the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. So at night, God is the pillar of fire that provides warmth for them so that they are not, uh, you know, the desert is very cold at night, right? But God provides the warmth. Verse 7, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So you see, God will preserve your going out, your coming inside. He is the one that goes before them. So think of it like a father, okay? Watching over his child as the child is taking the first few steps. So when you think of Israel leaving Egypt, you're actually thinking of Israel as a firstborn son of God, starting out on a journey to start walking. And this father watches him to watch over his steps so that his step does not stumble. That is the picture of of our God. That's That's why I say when we study the Bible, we are actually studying to know who is this God behind the scripture. How do we know him? By his, by his uh, interaction with Israel, by what he does to Israel and what he does for Israel, we get a chance to know who he is. Okay, so then you see that the cloud is always before them so that their eyes are seeing the glory of God in the cloud and their eyes is on the Lord and not on Moses. And that's what I hope that we can uh, constantly and and remind ourselves that we constantly do. And that is, our eyes are on God, not on any man or woman. Okay? Because He is the one, He is our good Heavenly Father who watches over us. So when when they came, and we know the story, okay, so I'm, I'm skipping to chapter 14, and that is where you read of how Pharaoh changed his mind because he told them, leave Egypt, but then he changed his mind and that's where he then sends his chariots and his armies to chase after Israel. So we pick up the story in Exodus 14 verse 10 and you see how, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then I want you to look at verse 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. These two verses are so amazing because Moses told them, Stand still and see Uh, how God will fight for you. And I want you to know something. Literally, they did nothing, but God did everything. So when Moses said, the Lord will fight for you, it's not just a nice phrase or something kind to say. It's not something to pat them on the back to encourage them. Literally, that's exactly what God did. The parting of the Red Sea was done by God. They walked on dry ground. And then the closing back of the Red Sea was also done by God. The children of Israel did not raise a single sword to fight the Egyptian. Everything was done by God. God was like a man of war. God was like a warrior fighting against the enemies of Israel. And that must be the picture again of who this God is. Amen? Stand still and see the salvation of God. Now let me then bring you to uh, as the as the Egyptians are chasing after the Israelites. Okay, and so in front of them is the Red Sea, and behind them is the, are the Egyptians, right? So you are 
stuck. The children of Israel are now stuck. So I want you to see this very, very beautiful verse. I want you to see in verse 19 in chapter 14. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So God came, God was in front, now God came behind, and the pillar of fire continued to provide light for the Israelites. But the cloud behind Israel shielded the light from the Egyptians. So the Egyptians uh, lived in darkness. Uh, what a beautiful imagery of how God's people are children of light. And the world is in the midst of a world in darkness. So you see how you know, the author puts things side by side together for us to see. And how God, the Bible always says, that He calls us out of darkness into His marvelous light. So before you were a Christian, you were living in the kingdom of darkness. You were living in darkness, like the Egyptians. But when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, He saved you and redeemed you, redeems you, just like Jesus is like Moses, okay, bringing the children of Israel out, right? So Jesus is the one that came to be God's deliverer and bring us out of darkness into light. All right? So now, this coming in front and behind, you remember in the English phrase, you always have this phrase that says, you are stuck between a rock and a hard place. But when it comes to us as Christians, we must always have this imagery in our mind. We are not stuck between a rock and a hard place. We are always stuck between God because He's in front and He's also behind us. All right. So I want to show you this week. I was very blessed when I uh, went to school and I started studying Greek. And my Greek lecturer showed us this verse in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. It's a verse that we're all very familiar with. Actually, you know the verse that says, uh, Jesus told the disciples, right, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. The last verse in Matthew. And then he says, behold, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. So we know this verse, but actually in the Greek, it is written in this way. It is actually written as, and behold, I with you am. Okay? So it's a little bit like Star Wars Yoda speaking. Okay? I with you am. But it is not like that. It's maybe George Lucas understood a little bit of Greek and he took it, okay? But I want to tell you that this is a very beautiful imagery. That God is in front of you. I am is in front of you and I am is also behind you. So when Jesus actually commissioned the disciples to go, he's saying, I am before you and I am behind you. As you go into all the world, and make disciples of all nations. So do you, do you see that? And, and can, you get, can you be encouraged and strengthened as you see the Word of God and see Scripture in this way? Okay, so all these New Testament writers, they, they don't have the New Testament, they only have the Old Testament. And when they write, they have certain picture in their mind. And so when we study the Old Testament, it gives us the ability to understand and appreciate these pictures because they are all found in Scripture. All right, so now let's, let's continue as we move on. Okay, I told you this. Uh, I will not read uh, the verse from Isaiah 43, but I want to show you that the signs and wonders okay, that God actually did continues to be a witness for generations to, to generations. Okay, how, how do I know that? That the signs and wonders were for generations to generations. And it was not just that, but it was also for the salvation of the nations. Because if you look at um, Joshua, and I want to show you this scripture from Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. You see this, okay, now let me, let me just put it into perspective. This is Joshua. That means, in other words, this is 40 years later, as Joshua sent two spies to Jericho. So when they went to Jericho, they met a, 
a prostitute there called Rahab. And Rahab was willing to shield them and take care of these two spies. And this is what Rahab said in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. It says, And Rahab said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Why? Verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. This is, okay, brothers and sisters, this is 40 years later. Rahab making this statement. We have heard how God dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Ok, which we are going to see later on in the Pentateuch, whom you destroyed utterly, and as soon as we heard these things, verse 11, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord, your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So Rahab is saying, Yahweh, Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitalized means Yahweh. Yahweh is truly God. And there is none other. So we are back again to what I shared last time. That all these signs and wonders are pointing to how God is the only God in the whole universe and there is none other. Okay? So, um, then we go on to Exodus chapter 15 and we see how after they cross the Red Sea, they begin to sing a song of Moses. Okay? I just want to read to you verse 1 to verse 4. Four, the song of Moses. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. Okay, this poetry or this song shows you again okay, who God is. God is, Moses says, the Lord is my strength. He is my salvation. He is a man of war. Salvation belongs to God. The battle belongs to God. Stand still and see the salvation of God. I think after I've gone through my own trial, okay, I have been trying to encourage and talk to different ones when they go through difficult times, especially even those who, are, who have certain uh, maybe court cases, charges, where there's a risk that they may eventually be incarcerated. And I always tell them that it is not about how great you can fight but it's about you understanding your own walk and relationship with God. And God is bringing you to this place to reveal Himself to you that salvation belongs to God and that the battle is the Lord and you can trust in Him. Yes, you do whatever you can do and you do whatever you must, but your faith and your heart must be in this God who loves you, cares for you, and He only has good thoughts to help us to have a hope and a future. So, these this, uh, Israelites, as they step out okay, and cross the Red Sea, that is the beginning of their journey as a nation. I think this is so beautiful, right? God Himself did everything, brought them through the Red Sea, and now they are formed as a nation that belongs to God. So this year in January, two things happened, two new things happened concurrently in my life. The first was the beginning of our fellowship. We started in the first weekend of January. The second thing that happened was in January, I started studying in Singapore Bible College. So as I was studying, I didn't know, I didn't plan, but the school assigned me to take a module on the Pentateuch. And it is in that January period when I was looking at the story of Exodus. And then I saw how this, when this new nation, this new community came out of Egypt, right? 
the the things that they experience. Okay, there are hardship, there are tests, there are trials, there are difficulties. But but each time you see how God looks after them, like a father looks after a little child, a little baby. And then in my mind, as I concurrently, right, I'm doing concurrently, I'm going to uh, we are starting this fellowship, and I'm just thinking in my mind. This is exactly how we in our fellowship will experience God. That is not about a man or woman. It's not about how great uh, the leader is. It's about God. We will encounter difficulties. We will face certain challenges. But we will also, through those challenges, have an opportunity to see who God is and to know Him. Just like Israel, they have a chance to know who He is. So I was... Uh, as I was going through the lessons and the courses, right, in school, you know, I just sometimes I would just be thinking about uh, how exciting it is because, you know, you don't know the future. You don't know what you're going to meet. All you know is you just have the Bible, you have a certain hope and a certain faith in your heart, and then you just begin this journey and you see how God reveals Himself and unveils His plans and purposes. You know, Israel will never imagine uh, how later on they were going to have King David and so on and so forth and how Jesus Christ the Messiah will come. I mean, I think they cannot see that far. And then and they cannot see how through Jesus Christ the nations, the Gentiles are going to come to God's kingdom. I don't think they can see that far. And similarly, I think for our fellowship, cannot see too far, but we have this hope. And my prayer is that may God allow us to really be a blessing one day to not just our community but to the other uh, nations of the world. Amen. Okay, so let's go on to uh, the, the main portion of what uh, today's sermon will be. It's not very long but I'm, I'm, talking to, I'm going to share with you about the wilderness wandering because we are looking at the period of time after they leave Egypt to the time they arrive at Mount Sinai. And this period of time is very interesting because you'll find them uh, complaining that they don't have water, you'll find them complaining they don't have food, you know, and, and, and you see how God came through for them. So this is a period called the wilderness wanderings. So the first place they came to in Exodus chapter 15 is a place called Mara. And Mara is a place where there's water, but the water is bitter, and the water, uh, can, they cannot drink, okay, because it's bitter water. So that's okay. Exodus chapter 15, verse 23. Now, when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Okay? And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Then he cast it into the waters. The waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now this play, this, this story uh, has a very significant purpose. Okay, and let me just share with you this purpose. Now, when they came to this place where there is, the water was bitter, right? Moses cried out to God, and God showed him a tree. And then, uh, so in other words, it's a very simple thing. It's like when they came to a place of, uh, it's not like they hit a roadblock, or they hit a place of lack, then God actually gave an instruction. Basically, God showing Moses a tree is like giving an instruction to him. So then Moses took the tree, and then he threw it into the water, and then the waters became sweet. So it is actually a, a, a lesson, okay? It's like a, how do, I, how do we call it? It's like a case study, okay? This is like a case study for the Israelites. It's like um, a lesson for them to learn. And the lesson is very simple. It's this. If you obey my instruction, I will turn your bitterness to sweetness. Simple? So this is actually a preparation for them as they progress to Sinai uh, into a time where they are going to be, remember I told you they're going to be a nation, right? So God is already establishing, it's like teaching a little child a very simple instruction. Recently, I, you know, um, my son, he, he had this 
all of a sudden he had this curiosity like could he teach a dog my dog a trick and so the trick was this that if the dog was willing to lift up his paw then my son would give him a treat so he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced long enough eventually when he comes near to the dog the dog lifts up his paw and then my son gives him a treat this is like something like that okay so God is saying I want you to see that if you, verse 26, let's look at it one more time. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight and you give ear to His commandments and you keep all His statutes, then He says, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So can you imagine you go through a certain... Uh, event in your life and out of that event came forth a lesson that you learned and every time something happens you remember this lesson you have learned and you walk again in the fear of God and how you see that the Bible says I want to remind you God says I remind you I am the one who heals you if you were to just obey me alright so you can actually see here so I just put on the slide okay that here is a picture of how a relationship that is based on good faith and trust should be liked. That in other words, these instructions are not burdensome. And obedience brings sweetness. But it is often Israel's own disobedience, their rebellion, that actually caused them to suffer uh, in their lives. I want you to know that, uh, like for example, I, I, I'm thinking about uh, a family, okay? about parent and child relationship. You know, when I say good faith, it's always beautiful when a father tells a child something and a child obeys. And the, but, the, the, but the most important thing is that as a father, make sure that your instructions are not burdensome, okay? But if you can do that, and you, you see that is pr primarily the, the way to go in a relationship. In other words, that is like the ideal Okay, I like, for example, you, you, you know, it's, even in Singapore recent times, right, because of COVID, it is always best if you, uh, because the government says put on a mask, so you put on a mask, and so everything is great. But it is when you do not obey, you don't act in good faith, you don't do the simple instruction, it's not burdensome, but when you don't do it, and that's where the law comes in. Okay, the, the requirement now is is that, oh, if you don't do it and you get caught, you'll be fine. And not only that, you may be charged in court. So Paul then makes one statement in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. And I want you to see this verse. He says, What purpose then does the law serve? And he says this, It was added because of transgression. Why is it that God initially, when he started, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt as a new nation, a new community. Actually, the instructions that he gave to them are not burdensome. They are actually quite okay, very easy to take care and to live it out. But it is when they continually break his heart and do things that displeases him that more and more laws were added into their lives. Do you know that? So you must understand, we are now, we haven't even arrived at Sinai. So th there was no, in a sense, the, the commandments that we, we know about or the laws that we think when we look at the Old Testament, we say, ah, we don't like to read the Old Testament, but it's full of laws. There's not much laws now. And all God requires for them is simple obedience. Simple obedience. I remember uh, recent times uh, we had the PMD, the Personal Mobility Devices. You know, everyone was happy scooping around in Singapore, right? And then, the, and then they started knocking people down and knocking o o older, uh, older folks. And then the government says, pay attention, you know, uh, be responsible, don't speed. But what do we do? We continue doing it. Continue speeding through crowded areas. And you continue to knock people down. And finally now, PMDs are banned. Laws are put in or added because of transgressions. 
So, what am I trying to share with you is that I hope in our fellowship that the aim of our fellowship is not to have more rules and regulations. But the aim of the new community and fellowship is that we learn to walk in good faith, to learn to love God and to love one another with purity of hearts. And that the, the more we have a culture where we honour each other and respect one another and love God and love one another with brotherly kindness and brotherly love, the lesser rules and regulations we need to have. And it applies to you as a parent in your, in your family as well. And I, I just, I share this with my testimony many times, how in my initial years as a parent, there were, I didn't know better, so, you know, I had a lot more corporal punishment. But as I began to progress on, I started to have lesser and lesser rules in my house. And I had more and more observa- like I'm more aware of, of the emotional state of my children. I'm more inclined to have dialogues with them rather than just impose strict rules on them. And I begin to see that their hearts and their lives begin to change. And I hope that when through the scriptures and through the word of God, we can actually learn how we can actually uh, uh, not only be you know, manage or, or lead a church, but it's in the area of a company, in the area of uh, a family, in many of these areas. Okay, we can learn God's godly wisdom and principles. Okay, and then now we come to the next uh, stage. So after they came to, they moved from Mara, and after they learned this important lesson, they went to a place called Elim. So let's look at verse 27. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the water. So they actually rested there for a while. There were wells of water enough for all of them and there were palm trees to provide shade for them. Then we come to chapter 16 and that's where you have the story of bread from heaven, manna from heaven. Okay, so there's also important lessons to learn over here. Uh, I want to show you verse 1. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. Okay, I want you to know, uh, wait, hold on, which is between Elim and Sinai. So you can see they're actually on a journey, right? From Elim, now they are on the way to Sinai. So between these two places is called the wilderness of Sin. Now, this word Sin has nothing to do with the English word Sin. Uh, This word Sin is actually associated with the word Sinai. So basically, it means the wilderness near Sinai. All right? So as they were there, you find that the Bible says in verse 1, On the 15th day of the second month, after they departed from the land of Egypt. So this is now one and a half months since they have left, which means that they have come to a place where they are running out of food. Now, that's where they begin to complain. Verse 2, then the, the whole true congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the pots of meat, and where we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Very extreme, right? They are, they, are, they are complaining. Verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Why, we, why is it that God says, I will rain down bread from heaven, and that is a way to test them? In, in the past, I didn't understand. Until I read the next verse, then I began to understand what it, he's trying to say. Verse 5. He says, And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Do you remember I was telling you earlier about Mara? How God was trying to train them or teach them through a case study, right? It's like a little, like a father training a child or teaching a child. Similarly over here. You see, God, when He rains down bread from heaven, He is going to rain down bread only for six days. And He's not going to rain bread or manna on the seventh day. So that is again a form of training to test them whether they will understand that they are to observe the Sabbath. 
So do you see the basic things in their Christian life, or I should use the word Christian, in their faith in Yahweh, the basics are being established during this period of time from Egypt to Sinai. Okay? Are you with me? Do you understand? So, now, that, I want you to see what is their response, okay? Now, so God told them daily provision. You have daily provision, right? And you only need to take enough for yourself. Look at verse 16. So this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So God told them, and Moses told them this, you take enough for one day and you don't leave it till tomorrow because if you leave it till tomorrow, it will, it will be spoiled. But did they listen? No, they didn't. Okay, so let's look at verse 19. And Moses said, let no one leave, it, leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did, they did not, notwithstanding, that means not, not, notwithstanding this, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. So is it not true that God says, I'm going to use this manna from heaven as a test. Whether will they listen to me? Let me ask you this thing. Is the instruction burdensome? It's not burdensome. There's more than enough for them every day. Just don't keep it to tomorrow. But they don't. They, they just cannot do the simple instructions. Then God told them a second thing. You are to rest on the Sabbath, right? Remember I told you verse 5, right? Then, but let's look at verse 22. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay out for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not sting, nor were there any worms in it. Then he says, Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened. Okay, this is where you see that some of the people went out on the seventh day together, but they found none. Do you see? We're always testing. We're always trying to see how close we can walk to the edge without falling off the cliff. The disobedience, the rebellious nature in man is what we always see in the Bible. But I want to establish this thing, that the God's instructions to us are not burdensome, that they are actually to, to help us to, to sort of like, you can say, to shape us, to train us okay, in a way that will reflect His glory and His image and likeness. All right, so we see this. Um, this continue on. Okay, and the, the scriptures tell us this that this is something that happens every day, day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out for forty years, from the old generation that lived life like this until the new generation came up and the old generation passed away. They continue to live in this lifestyle until it is ingrained in them the principle of the Sabbath. That is ingrained in them that I must trust God for my daily provision, that I cannot be a hoarder, I cannot be so afraid that I will not have enough tomorrow, so I hope and hope for myself. God trains them until the new generation goes into the border of Canaan, and just when they are about to enter Canaan, that's where the manna stops, and then they enter into Canaan in the time of Joshua. All right, so I just want you to know that that's all in chapter 16, and you can actually... Uh, read it for yourself. Now let's go on to the water from the rock, which is in chapter 17. So they complained there was uh, the water was bitter in Mara and it became sweet. They complained there was no bread and God rained bread from heaven. Then now they say there was no water. So God commanded Moses to strike the rock in Horeb and water came out from them. Now you can see this. What what is it? What is the common thing that we see? God has come through for them again and again and provided for them. Now, what is the end result? Look at Exodus chapter 17, 
and verse 7. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I tell you, at the end of the day, the children of Israel were not only... Um, they, they, they not only did not appreciate what God has done for them, they still continue to doubt whether God was actually with them or not. So they complained. Uh, when they complained, there was no food, God gave them manna. When they complained, there was no water, God gave them water. And their hearts, I want you to see again, what is their hearts? Look at verse, chapter 17 and verse 2. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, I think this is what I want you to see, the, what did they say from their mouth? Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with us? Now, I want to say this thing, okay, and this is my main point for this portion. And that is, we can empathize with the children of Israel because they are in the wilderness and they didn't have food and they did not have water. We can empathize, right, that they will be panicking and they will be complaining. But what we forget to see or we, f we forget is that their desire to go back to Egypt, okay? And when I think about their desire to go back to Egypt, I think about one other thing which we often forget and that is their they are disregard for the whole divine plan of God to bring Israel back to Canaan. Actually, what I mean is this. You see, you don't remember God promised Abraham that through you, the families of the earth will be blessed. Do you remember? So, when God delivered them out of Egypt to bring them to Canaan, it's because God has promised Abraham, I will give you this land and I will bless you and through you, the families of the earth will be blessed. But for the children of Israel, they were only thinking about what to eat, what to drink, and what to wear. And that's all they could think about. In other words, the overall divine plan of God for the salvation of the world is really not in their minds at all. They disregard it and they were ignorant of it. So let's bring it back to our context. Every day as we go through life, we go through trials, difficulties, we have challenges, we face COVID-19 pandemic, economy is not doing well, we are just struck, we are worrying about our, our jobs and we're also worrying about, you know, how we're going to make ends meet day to day, right? I mean, that's why I say we can, I can empathize and we can understand that. But very often in the midst of all this going round and round in circles, we often forget the overall divine Redemption plan of God for us as His people. Isn't it? That we've forgotten that we are to bear witness. So God wants us to be His witness, but we often don't think about wanting to be a witness for Him. So we only want God to come and be with us, bless us, help us, get us out of our misery and our suffering. But we forget that there is an another mission of God and we have neglected that mission. And so that's the main thing I really want to highlight to you in this message. That Jesus says this, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things that you need shall be added to you. Do not worry about what you eat, what you drink or what you wear. For these things the Gentiles are the ones who worry. But you, you are of your heavenly Father who will not allow a sparrow to fall. He knows the number of hairs on your head. But what God really wants for us to pay more attention to is His kingdom and His mission to bring salvation to the world. And so we come to the end and in Gen uh, Exodus chapter 17, we see, uh, we're not going to spend time talking about it, but we see the introduction of Joshua. Okay? That's the first time we see this character being introduced and we then see uh, the defeat of the Amalekites. Why are we not going to look at this? 
is because we're going to look at this later when we look at numbers because there is certain uh, patterns that we want to see okay and the reason why I call this section a friend and a foe is because the foe is the Amalekites and the friend is Jethro the father-in-law of Moses who came and, and received him and welcomed him so Gen uh, Exodus chapter 18 verse 8 to 11 will be the last verse that we're going to look at and it says here, I want you to look at your Bible, verse 8. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptian. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord, that is Yahweh, is greater than all the gods for in the very thing in which they behave proudly, he was above them. Two things you see over here that Jethro said. He said that the Lord Okay, he rejoiced over all that the Lord had done for Israel and then he made a proclamation. Now I know that Yahweh, the Lord, is greater than all other gods. So again, you see, it ties back again to what I've been trying to show you that all the signs and wonders and miracles that God did for Israel is for the nations, is for people, for Israel to be a witness and for the nations to see how, who this God is. So, Brothers and sisters, everything God has done in your life and my life. Yes, thank God. He has blessed us, saved us, redeemed us, healed us, or done things that, you know, to, to redeem us or save us from certain um, uh, situations in our life. Yes. But what is it for? It's so that we can be a witness and others can see that there is no other God except the God of Israel. That Yahweh alone is Lord. Amen. So, I want to share with you the conclusion. And the conclusion today, we saw again how God fights for Israel like a warrior. We see that He's a man of war. Salvation belongs to God. We see that the battle belongs to the Lord. Today we saw again how God and what God does is a witness for all generations. And today we also saw how God faithfully goes before Israel and covers them. In other words, He goes before them and He goes behind them. Behold, I with you am. Okay? And then we also saw as we are challenged to not just live worrying about what we eat and what we drink, but we are not to disregard the divine redemption plan of God. We are to be a witness for the Lord. Amen. Isaiah 43 and verse 10 to 12 says this, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Saviour. I have declared and save, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says Yahweh, that I am God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we just want to worship God in a song before we close today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Lord, the only true God, and there is none other. Today, O oh God, I pray that you open up our hearts, that in the midst of all the troubles that we've experienced around our life, we may feel trapped on different sides, but you are the one that goes before us, and you are our real God. And that everything you are doing is to preserve us, watch over us like a father watches over his child that we will not stumble in our steps. And every good that you have done for us, Lord, you want us to be a witness to the nations of the world, to all around us 
that we are your people. May you, O oh God, once again help us to lift up our eyes so that our eyes are looking on things above and not just on the things on the earth. Help us, O oh God, not to be afraid. Help us not to only worry about the things of this life, for our life does not consist of the things that we possess. But help us to see that there's a greater mission of God, there's a greater purpose in our life. And I pray that God, through our fellowship, more and more people can come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together and sing this song. Amen. I trust in you For I know you will lead me through And I know you are faithful to the end And when the storms are drawing
Instructions of the words of God are not burdensome. When we learn to relate to Him in good faith, in trust, just like a father and a child, how God wants to, whatever instructions He gives to us is because He cares for us. He wants us to, to be in a covenant relationship with Him and he wants to give us a hope and a future and blessing. But He wants us to understand that every good thing He has done in our life is also for the purpose of us being a witness, a testimony to the nations of the world. And let's not forget this aspect of the mission of God. Father, I just pray today for everyone who is going through challenges or a difficult time that we will not draw away from you thinking that your demands or your laws or your words your commandments are too harsh or difficult how we learn to go the other direction we will learn to walk even closer to you in good faith in trust in obedience to you because Lord, you have saved us from our sin. It's your grace, your kindness, your mercy that today we can even stand before you. And you have a great plan and purpose for us, individually and as a community. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you to continue to do that work of sanctification in our lives and do the work of bringing us, transforming us, our lives and our family, our children and our children's children. Teach us, O oh God, to truly live out your image and your likeness, to be the chosen people of God, the covenant people of God, a cross-bearing community, a holy people, a royal priesthood in society. Thank you, O oh God, for hearing our prayers today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. 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 I hope you are blessed today by the Word and this time that we have to look into His Word. You know, I've intentionally... You know, these stories are, uh, I believe, are a bit more familiar to us. But what I try to bring out are things that we may have missed out or we may have not have heard before on the significance of certain things that happen uh, as we go through these narratives, this storyline. It is all so um, important right, that we know all these things. But before we go today, why don't we say the Lord's Prayer and then uh, let me just give you the benediction, okay? Let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And may God establish your steps every single day as He watches over you like the way He watches over the Israelites in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. May you always experience God going before you and behind you. He is your front guard. He is your rear guard. God be with you all now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. I'll see you again next week. God bless you. Uh, for those of you who are still at some, some time you want to hang around, uh, we will just uh, stay back for a while. Amen. God bless.